Good morning, good evening, good day, and welcome to Drama Buds. I'm Francine, I really love K-dramas, and I'm going to spend as much time as I want talking about them. Welcome to my podcast. So hello everyone. On today's episode, we're going to talk about the melodramatic. Okay. Um, <laughs> I feel like it's it's been a year. I've I've been watching K dramas for like a year now, and I really think I've gotten better at figuring out what my tastes are. <laughs> you know, I feel like within an episode or so, I can already tell if I'm going to like something, and be melodramatic. Kind of hit that for me. I mean, surprisingly. You know, knowing me, if if you've listened to any of my other podcasts, you probably know that I am a big slice of life fan. Whatever the definition of that genre is, um, I just love slice of life. I love workplace dramas. I love sadness. <laughs> I love daily lives. I love, you know, just just people living, striving, going. <laughs> um and be melodramatic was kind of that show, but the most lighthearted one I've watched. More, more so than hospital, like the Shin PD shows, because I feel like um, be melodramatic was slice of life leaning funny or leaning comedy, and then the Shin PD shows are slice of life leaning you know warm and and then homey and all that. Okay. <laughs> the funny thing is when I when I describe this show or when I try to describe be melodramatic, I refer to it as like what run on was supposed to be like for me. Cause you know, if if <laughs> if you've listened to my run on podcast episode, uh I didn't like that show, but I I'll I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um be melodramatic for me is just very cleverly written it's it's witty and they talk a lot but it's still heartwarming like they still have a lot of those moments and okay among all the comedies i've watched this is the humor that i like the most like it clicked with me the most um cool thing about the show is that it was written and directed by the same person lee byung hoon who was also the writer slash director of 20 a 2015 film and Extreme Job, the highest grossing box office movie, whatever, in in Korea. Like, he hit it big. Um, And then he made this drama. Um, It really helps to be familiar with his movies, to know his, like, his style and his brand of humor. Um... And I think this show really benefits from someone having almost complete creative control over what's going on. Which I will, once again, I'll discuss later. So, what is this show even about? Um, Three friends approaching their 30s who um, all work in the entertainment industry and they're dealing with love, career, and life issues. And just with that, you know, simple description. You already know that this is my kind of show. I love it when people just deal with life. <laughs> um, that's that is my genre. Okay, so plot and characters. First, we have Im Jin Ju, played by Chun Woo Hee. She's an assistant writer for a famous um drama writer. Uh, Jin Ju is a little weird. She's um she's kind of rebellious in a way. Like she just, you know, she she doesn't just how how would I say it? She doesn't just bow down to her boss and stuff. Like she she talks back essentially. Like she's a little out of the box and quirky that way. Um but she's very talented. Really she is. Um her entry for a screenwriting contest, um her she called her show it will be okay when you turn 30 um it was passed over uh by the executives who were judging that contest but director son bomsu played by anje hong decided to pick it up 
And essentially, that's kind of the start of her story now. Now she's the head writer of her own drama and she's able to let her creative voice be heard. But, you know, her journey is the journey of the show. Like, (laughs) yeah, she got what she wanted, but now she actually has to work for it. And writing a show is a struggle in itself. Getting picked up is a struggle, but like the 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 process after it just just as difficult. Uh Jinju develops a love line with Son Bomtu. Um yeah, he's I, he's billed as like one of the main cast, but I don't really have the energy <laughs> to go through all of them. I just want to go through the girls because honestly they matter way more than the guys. Um but yeah, Bomsu is you know, in a nutshell, he's a successful drama writer. Um, and he, personality-wise, he's just as weird. He's just as wacky as her. But he has the success to back his antics up. So, you know, he can do whatever he wants because he's successful. But she still has to deal with, like, you know, sucking up to her boss or, you know, Trying to suck up to her boss but failing because she's she just can't. Um because she's not successful yet. Um Okay, another character that kind of revolves around Jinju is um her on and off ex boyfriend, who is now completely off, um Kim Wandong, played by Lee Yujin, who coincidentally is Bong Su's junior in JBC. Um Though it's completely over between um, Jinju and Huandong, there's still history there, you know? Like, it was many, many years of a relationship that they wouldn't give up on. Like, they'd break up and then they'd just talk to each other again and they're back on and off again and on again. So, you know, you can't help that there's history there. Um, It's a very light-hearted quote unquote love triangle but but you kind of know that she's bound to choose Bomsu because come on you know it's it's over and whatever I'll discuss the relationship later um in a way Jinju is the main girl among the three main girls because their jobs will revolve around the drama she's writing and much like the drama that she's writing um most of it revolves around the stories of the people around her. So it kind of goes back and forth on that. But but yeah. So our next main girl is Wang Hanju, played by Han ji She is the marketing head in a production company. Which sounds super fancy, but it's mostly just trying to get actors and directors to agree to product placement because, you know, the production company made a deal with the company that they're going to feature their product in this episode for this long. So even if it's embarrassing and totally shoehorned, you have to put that wet mop into your drama. (laughs) Um, Yeah, it's super funny how they deal with BPL in this show. Uh, Anyway... Hanju, actually, aside from her job, is a single mom who got pregnant and married when she was just in college, I think. But her ex-husband divorced her because he was never that serious. It was just one ugh, one night, one mistake, and then, you know, he left her and then he became famous for, for some reason. Um... Her struggle is really just balancing her job with being a single mom, which is pretty much a struggle that never ends. You know, that that's that's the thing. It's like, okay, she got she started out as like a personal assistant or something, and then you know, she worked her way up many, many years, and yeah, her career is going okay. She she got the big promotion, but but that doesn't mean like life gets easier. It, it just continually gets more difficult for her. So yeah, it's all about just striking striking that balance for her. Um, the thing with uh what's her name? <laughs> Hanju is that she used to be like a campus sweetheart, you know, so many guys hit on her and all that. But that all ended when she became a mom. So in a way, her story kind of tackles femininity and how she you know she still wants to date 
she wants to experience love and romance and sex and all of that. Like, just because she's a mom doesn't mean, like, that part of her life is immediately over, you know? Hancho's a character needed to change the least. Honestly, like, her character is pretty stable. She's pretty mature. She just has to deal with the day-to-day struggles, in a sense. But, but yeah, she still has to deal with the ongoing struggle of, of being a single mom and, you know, someone who wants to do well in her job. And she's also dealing with her new junior, uh, Chu Jae-hun, played by Gong Myung, who is also billed as one of the main cast, <laughs> who I will not discuss that much. Anyway, um, Jae-hun is in a toxic relationship with this girlfriend who cheated on him and admitted to it, but won't leave his um apartment, even if he's already broken up with her. And Jaehoon's relationship with Hanju is kind of like a, a will they or won't they? But but not really, because I feel like the romance focus they didn't focus too much on the romance between them. Like there were just hints of it, but she was dealing with her own things, he was dealing with his own thing, and his storyline got a lot of screen time for that. So it, it was kind of very lightly hinted on. But still, still there. And lastly, our last main girl, my best girl, is Lee Eun Jung, played by John Yo Bin. She's a documentary director who hit it big a few years ago with a documentary about a Japanese loyalists. I like Koreans who were loyalists to Japan when when back when they were being occupied. Anyway, so she met um Hongdae, someone whose family was I think his family's full of Japanese loyalists. And, you know, she met him through work. And then after that huge movie, they fell in love. You know, like, I remember that was in the very first episode. Something about, like, there was something greater than fame and money. And that was love. And then he died. (laughs) Spoiler alert. I mean, it's in the first episode. And this is really the part that, like, got me hooked on the show. But... He died. And then she attempted to take her life soon after. And she was saved just in time by her younger brother, Hyobong, who was living with her at the time. And then after that, the two girls moved in with her to to keep her company, you know, to take care of her. And she's okay. It's, It's been a few years after that. Like, she's okay. But she sees Hongdae around her. And, and talks to him as if he's actually there. And, like, her friends have noticed it. You know, of course, like, they notice her staring into space and responding to someone who isn't there, but they don't comment on it because, because that might be her way of coping with the grief. And, and that's much better than, you know, hurting herself or just losing her grip on life, you know? So, so it, it's... If that's her coping coping mechanism, then so be it. Um, and like at this point, it's been several years. Now she wants to make a new documentary about an actress this time, Lee So Min, and and her daily life. So So Min used to be their friend in college, but they drifted apart, and she became famous. So there was a little hostility between So Min and Unjong at the start. Uh, and in the process of making the documentary, you know, as we see more of So Min's life and her super, super close relationship with her manager who used to be her um, high school classmate or something, eventually So Min and Min Jun appre- uh, admit, <laughs> admit their feelings for each other and then Somin gets casted for Jinju's drama. So that essentially ties everyone's careers together. Okay, back to Unjung, sorry. Um, Unjung's journey isn't necessarily about finding success or balance anymore. Like, she's already achieved that. So work now is a way for her to find some sort of purpose in a life that's had no direction for, for so long. Um... She's making a documentary about an actress's daily life. And that seems very shallow. But like I think 
she needed to see outside of her usual circle and her her usual world. And like her previous work, her only work actually, was so tied to Hongdae. So by making something else, it's kind of a way of moving on, you know? Like she even donated all the money she earned from that movie to a charity because, because she wanted to. Because that's kind of how meaningless it was to her now. The, the fame, the money is meaningless to her because her love is gone. But, you know, she she has to move on somehow. And and if work is the way to do that, then then so be it. I really love Unjung's story because it's really, it tackles, you know, mental health, it tackles grief, it tackles depression. And it also shows how having a genuine support system is so, so, so important to people who are dealing with things. Like, you know, she would not have been here without the people in her life. And not just in that moment, but just them being there for her in the past two years, I think, two years of her dealing with her grief and not saying a single thing about it. Just not processing it at all. But no one can... No one can force her to process it. All they can do is be there for her. You know, and until until she's ready for that. Okay, so there are lots of other characters. And as I mentioned, Bomsu and Jehun are considered like main leads. You know, they're part of the main cast. But I just want to focus on the three girls because they really are like the heart of the show. And, and they're all very, very well written and stuff. Okay, so... I mentioned earlier, <laughs> I mentioned Run On earlier, right? The, the recent K drama Run On. And in case you missed it from my podcast episode, in case you missed it, I didn't like Run On. Okay? They, they talk too much. And by talking a lot, that makes them quirky. You know, if you feel like num- their number one character trait is that they're quirky, um, it wasn't slice of life. Like how some people were describing it. Like to me, it was just a rom-com, guys. The main struggle is like, are they gonna end up together or not? And it seemed like their resolutions were tied to them finally being together. So is that not just a rom-com or a romance show? I don't know. Um, Personally, I just was not attached to any of the characters at all. Like sure, they had struggles and stuff, but it really seemed to me like their main issue was the romance. So I don't know. I don't know, man. That's just me. <laughs> um, so back to B-Mello. Uh, I feel like this is what Ronon was trying to be. Or what it was trying to make me feel. But it wasn't like B-Mello is not as romance focused. Like, okay, let's let's run down the, the things I did not like about Ronon and how you know, B-Mello gets a pass. <laughs> okay, so yes, in B-Mello, they talk a lot. Especially Jinju and Bomsu, who, you know, are the the quirky ones. They're, they're the weird characters. They're the out-of-the-box ones. Like, okay, fine. You do you. You be you. I mean, they're obviously my least favorite characters. <laughs> obviously, with how I talk about them, they are definitely my least favorite characters. Um, But, but it's just accepted them. Like, what am I gonna do? Hate the entire show. Hate all the good it's giving me just because of two terrible main leads. Oh well. <laughs> like the supporting people and the other main leads are so strong that it's like, I'll just let it be. Because it's actually not that bad. You know, like at the start when I notice how their conversations flow, like, okay, yeah, they're doing a run on. <laughs> but but okay, when they did become a couple, when Jinju and Bomsu finally ended up together, like that was episode twelve or eleven or something, they weren't excessively annoying. They actually weren't that annoying. They were pretty healthy and professional about it, which to me was actually my main concern because like they're working on a drama together, right? And it hasn't even started production or filming, and you're already hooking up. So yeah, like to me, it was it just. I was worried that it was going to be very unprofessional and it would get in the way of the drama. But they really made it a point not to do that. So 
I'm very happy with how they dealt with their relationship. Okay, more on that later. Okay, so talking back to the talking. Um, the conversations, you know, the conversation style that I don't like, the constant back and forth that just has no flow. It's as if people are just saying something that cuts to the next person, the next person, the next person. You know, and, and it's just about the, the point of the conversation is to prove that they can say a lot of things and be articulate and quirky and that's funny. Okay, but in fairness, because the humor is um deadpan, dry humor, I, I like that. And so those conversations were fine with me if it's just about showing off the humor. But if it's showing off like, the romance or the chemistry between Jinju and Bomsu. I don't care. I'm just like, shut up. Just, you know, whatever. Have a normal conversation like human beings. Why must you speak this much? Yeah, so essentially, conversation related to humor, fine. I laugh. I laughed so much in this show. I'm surprised. Um, But if it's romance, I hate it. <laughs> yes. Okay, so... In general, yes, they all had those like talkative moments, but at least as characters, it wasn't like them being talkative and quirky was not, it wasn't a character trait, you know, except for Jinjun Bomsu, which once again, that's why I like them the least. Okay, so yeah, I feel like it was just part of the writer's style, you know, but it wasn't like you wrote a character to be talkative just for the sake of, you know, <laughs> being talkative. If, I don't know, man. Maybe I'm just making mental gymnastics because I don't like run on. But <laughs> guys, I'm a hater. Come on, it's episode twenty. You should know this by now. Okay, next. Um, genre, genre wise, and I feel like B Meadow was more focused. It's like I understood immediately that the genre is slice of life leaning comedy with some sadness and some romance involved. I was not confused at all at what this show was trying to be. It wasn't like people are saying that it's this and that it's more profound than what it actually is to me. No, I got immediately that, okay, this is a comedy. So you have these like very shallow expectations. But it goes deep when it wants to go deep. And it can. It does it really well. So it's like, yeah, go. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> You're not trying to be profound from the get-go. The moments just come when they naturally come. Uh, okay, another thing that kind of, you know, gets this a free pass uh, in terms of genre is that it helps that they all work in the same industry. So their struggles were kind of related to each other, obviously. And yeah, for me, that's, I don't know, am I really confusing slice of life with workplace dramas? Well, no, no, there are workplace dramas that are like, you know, just drama intense murder mystery thriller or like political types but there's there are workplace dramas that aren't slice of life therefore but are not all slice of life dramas are workplace dramas i think it just it matters that there is a shared setting you know like in reply they all study in the same school or live in the same neighborhood and stuff so so that's their shared setting Right? And so with Missing, it's the office. And with Hospital Playlist, it's the hospital. <laughs> with Prison Playbook, it's the prison. You get the point. I think the shared setting works. Yeah. <laughs> yes. There. Okay. Period. All right. We're done. Um. Okay. Another thing I didn't like about Run On was that I felt like most of the scenes were just back and forth conversation shot after shot after shot and so i just got tired of watching it like as i said i don't need to watch it there are no visual details to this i can just keep reading whatever they're saying um the thing with i like about b mellow was that the direction directioning <laughs> the directing was very intentional it had a lot of I wouldn't call it visual gags. No, no, no. But like, they're just scenes that you know this director is trying something different. You know, okay. One of the funniest scenes for me was towards the end where like Hanju was revealing something and, and essentially they were 
Inguk, her son, by the way, uh, Inguk was sleeping in the other room. So they were all in the living room and like, okay, um, we can't. <laughs> ASR, ASMR preview here, but okay, so Inguk, um, can't hear us. So we have to talk in whispers, okay? And then essentially they're arguing in whispers. So everything was in subtitles. Like you could hear them faintly whispering in in the background, but the shot was pretty far from them. Like just I don't know. I don't know what you call shots, but like it was far from them and you could hear them whispering faintly in the background, but you could see them arguing very passionately. But in whispers. So it was just so, so funny. It's such an unconventional scene. So I felt like, you know, once again, if I weren't watching it, it wouldn't be half as funny. But it was just so good. Basically, it wasn't just conversation after conversation. And considering all the other points, like characters had genuine connections. And then they all had their own journeys that weren't focused on romance. Okay, essentially, most of the things I really didn't like about Run On, they fixed it or found a way to make it work. There you go. Okay, so even if they do do a Run On, it's really a term. We really call it like, oh, they're doing a Run On again. It's like, oh, God. Um, Every time we do that, like, sometimes I hate it and sometimes it's fine. And, you know, the genre stuff, they're clear about that. And yeah. Essentially, I like the show. But, but you know, there are other stuff I don't like. Not a lot, but they exist. So, um, the supporting characters, there were a lot of them. And they all kind of had their own stories. It spent a lot of time on comedic subplots. You know, like there's this romance between the company nutritionist and uh, Bomsu's fellow director. And then there's this love triangle between uh, the writer Jinju used to work for and then the producer of her show who is her longtime friend. And then the president of the company that of the agency Somin is in. Like there's just a lot going on. Uh, and you know... I didn't care about it, but I just accepted it because it doesn't take that much time. Like, yeah, there's a pretty significant amount of screen time per episode, but if I ignore it, the rest of the stuff is good. Okay, another thing I did not like all that much is the fact that Jinju is the main girl and that as the main girl, she gets a love line. Because, like, honestly, she's the most unlikable of the three at the beginning of the show. In a way that makes sense. In a way that's okay because she needs the most growth as a character. And she's the main focus of the show. Like, if she were perfectly fine from the get-go, then yeah, this is not an internal transformation show. She requires no change. She just needs to go through the motions, right? Uh, So it's fine that she was kind of annoying because she did significantly tone down by the end of it. Like... Yeah, I cannot fully describe her transformation, honestly. I didn't pay too much attention to her. Because most of her stuff is like drama. Yeah, working on her drama. But even working on her drama is tied to the love line. And she's the only one who had like a legit love line in the show. But I'm also kind of okay with it. Because it developed naturally as... She was writing the show with Bomsu. It wasn't like, you know, they're writing the show and then separately they have this love line thing going on. It's like, no, as they write the show, they get to know each other, they work with each other, and then, and then slowly they fall, you know? And the thing is, like, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, when they got together, they didn't face those stupid problems, like being unprofessional and letting that get in the way of the drama. Like, I, I really, 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 for some reason, are my standards this low? Like, as long as they're professional, as long as they just do their jobs, it's okay. That's healthy to me. <laughs> because really, like, you'd be surprised at how unprofessional people are in K-dramas, you know? It's like, you're the one who decided to hook up or to hit on each other while working on this, and then you're gonna be unprofessional, like... Come on, man. You could have kept it in your pants for longer until this project was over and and you wouldn't have missed anything. Like, 
you wouldn't have messed things up either, you know? So yeah, I just, maybe I don't like Jinju as main girl because I wish Unjong was main girl, <laughs> okay? And the thing is like, she's my best girl. Unjong is my best girl. So this is obviously just my preference, but I really wish she were the main girl. And, and, and in general, she lacks screen time. It's like, I really could notice that Unjung lacks screen time compared to the other two. And though, okay, I'm going to contradict myself or like rebut myself anyway. Um, Even though I want her to be the main girl, it wouldn't fit tonally, you know, with the rest of the show because her story and her journey is quite heavy. And uh, yeah, the annoying thing is even if she's not the main girl, I would have thought she would have... She should get more screen time because she's the one who has the most, you know, to go through and to deal with. Um, it doesn't help that her job isn't tied to the other two, connected to like the drama that Jinju is working on until like, you know, two thirds of the way into the show. Um, even Somin, you know, the actress that she's making a docu on. Someone got more screen time than her at some point. She, someone even got like a flashback and a, a love line. So, yo, what the heck? But you know, it's fine. Unjung got like the the meaningful emotional journey, so it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Um, you know what? Let's just move on to the good things because there are a lot of like great great things about the show. First of all, the humor. Once again, same writer slash director as Extreme Job and 20. So, very dry, like, deadpan humor. And, yeah, at times, you know, it's a bit wacky. But it never got to the point that this is, like, slapstick comedy already. Unlike, <laughs> I'll give the example, okay. Um, the Good Manager, fire, The Fire Priest, and Vincenzo all have the same writer, I think. And so that brand of humor is very slapstick. Sometimes the humor isn't like pop culture or like, you know, their pop culture references. But it was still corny for me most of the time. Like, I'm watching Vincenzo right now, weekly. Not really because I'm so interested in the story or because I find it so entertaining. But just because I want to see Song Joong Ki and Jon Yo Bean, my best girl. Um, Just because I'm a fan of the actors. And it's like, I don't really care if it's not up to my tastes all that much like i you know it's a comedy i shouldn't be taking it that seriously i'm guys i'm starting to be a more tolerant person you know this is character development for me too you know anyway so another aspect of the humor that's great about it is how like meta it is or how self-aware you know, because it's set in the entertainment industry, it's a drama about making a drama and all the aspects related to it. It's very self-aware of what it's doing and what it's poking fun at. Like, first of all, product placement or PPL. Like, <laughs> there was this funny sequence in some episode where, okay, so um, Hanju is negotiating for a PPL deal in in this in the drama that they're making, right? And so. Uh, Jaehoon describes uh, how maybe they could shoehorn PPL into the episode, a massage chair into the episode, uh, into the house of a poor writer. Yeah, that's the character. And magically, she has a massage chair in her tiny apartment. Okay. And so right after that, like, funny dream or fantasy sequence, whatever, description, right after that... <laughs> There's a straight up PPL, you know, a water bottle or like a drink with its logo right smack dab in the middle of the shot. Um, it's like, oh, you must be tired after this conversation. Have something to drink. And then it's just right there, straight in your face. Vitamin water, whatever it is. And it's like, this show knows exactly what it's doing. That's why it's funny. You know, they, they use the fact that it's a show about K-dramas. It's K-drama about K-dramas and all the, the stupid things that have to go into K-dramas. And let's just run with it. 
let's just go with it. Um, another super funny self-aware thing about the show is that you know toward at the end of the show when when Jinju's drama is finally um released, like they're you know stressing out over the one percent ratings, and you know Bomsu is comforting her by saying, "Hey, maybe it'll pick up." You know, later it's it's okay to start low. You can still get higher ratings later. Meanwhile, like by that time in production of of B Mello, like they've already seen that their ratings only hit one percent and have never. <laughs> it's so sad that they're never the ratings never even hit two percent. It's really really sad. But like it's it's great that even the show can poke fun at it like poke fun at their own ratings uh yeah and like the funny thing is that you know the the drama that jinju is writing also ties back to the actual characters in b mellow right uh and the final episode basically has an epilogue for all the characters and their subplots like it just goes full circle you know what they're making ties back to themselves so Everything feels like it's progressing as they write more of the drama and and go on with their lives. So so essentially, like even the the meta funny stuff kind of ties back really cohesively. I don't know. I don't know. And I think for me, like my the thing I like the most about this show is its theme, which I realized like super belatedly. And by belatedly, I mean like as I was writing this outline, as I was thinking of like, what is Hanju's journey? Like, what is she dealing with? What are they all dealing with? Well, what what is the theme of this show? I never, I never, I just knew I liked the show and I liked what I felt while watching it, but I couldn't really put it into words. And then I finally was able to do so. So I think what I got from the show is that their struggles are all continuing, continuous struggles. It would, that they never end after a certain milestone. Like, okay, all these struggles will end when I get a promotion or when my script is picked up or, or when my kid turns a certain age, when I make a hit movie, when I've made it how many days or months or years after someone dies, I'll be over it. Everything will be okay. I realized super, super belatedly, like, the theme of the show is the very opposite of it will be okay when you turn 30, which is Jinju's drama, right? It's it's the story she's writing kind of about herself and her friends saying that it will be okay when you turn 30, but their actual lives show that it doesn't. It, it will not all be okay when you turn 30. But the thing is, you don't need to get your life all together by that certain age, by that milestone. Or th- or the other way around is like, that milestone does not signify that you will get everything together and you'll be completely fine after that. Like, things won't exactly be okay after this event, after this milestone. But but you just have to keep going and then keep finding yourself whatever it is that you're looking for and despite it like you'll be a little better a little smarter a little more capable after going through all that and you know how much i love that message you know i love the message of just you know just keep going just keep living just keep striving and and you'll find whatever path there is. You'll find that things will be okay. It will be okay. Like I think the message of like is like you just have to keep going and it will be okay. But not when you turn 30 or when you achieve this or that or whatever. It will just come, you know? And like I, I forgot the entire monologue towards the end, but something like something about the age of being 30. It's like you're kind of you know, you're too old to be making the same excuses and all that. But you're also so too young and people can still look down on you and, and tell you that you have so much more growing up to do. But but hey, look at where you are now and you're, you'll realize that you're definitely in a better place than where you were before. Or like you are a better person. You've grown more 
and are better than than who you used to be or how you used to be. Something something like that. It was a pretty nice monologue towards the end. Um yeah, I love that message. You know, you know that's my favorite kind of message. So so yeah, I think that's really the strength of the show. It's like it took me a while to put it into words, but I managed to do it, which means I kind of understood the show. <laughs> I understood what it was trying to teach me or what it was trying to make me feel. So I like it. Okay. So <laughs> moving on to another strength of the show, which is of course the relationships among the uh among all the characters. Like, first of all, the friendship among the three main girls is the best. I have nothing to say. Like, you never question these friends. And they never fight. They never act petty. They they don't, you know, hold grudges against each other. Like, it genuinely feels like these three are, are friends who are here for each other. And like, nothing could have been accomplished without their support for each other. So that's kind of... It's pretty amazing. I don't know. It was just a super heartwarming relationship. And it's like, that was never in question. Their friendship was never a question. It was just, it is. It is. <laughs> they are great, great friends who will support each other, who will be there for each other, who don't fight, who don't bicker, who just are good, good people <laughs> to each other there. It's just, I love seeing wholesome friendships like that. Moving on to another great relationship, which is the toxic relationship with me, between Jaehoon and Haehoon. <laughs> um, okay, I didn't like this relationship because it's admirable. I, I liked it because it was depicting something that I think a lot of people would be frustrated by. I mean, I was frustrated by the toxic relationship between Jaehoon and Haehoon. So... She cheated on him, right? And she admitted it. And he broke up with her. But she kept living with him. And, you know, it's so annoying. It's just like, girl, leave. Or to him, it's like, oh my god, kick her out. Drag her screaming and crying. I don't care, man. Love yourself. Get out of this. But like, towards... Or at the very end, actually. It was Hanju who, who had this conversation with Jaehoon. But like, she said something like, Toxic relationships take two. It wasn't just like she was toxic or he was toxic. It's like, okay, objectively, she is the more terrible one. She's obviously more terrible than him. But he wasn't perfect either. Or, like Her description was he tried to own her or to tame her, to make her into what he wanted. And, and he was disappointed when she didn't act how he wanted her to and so he kind of waved leaving or breaking up with her as a way to tame her to you make to make her into what he wanted her to be but it didn't work because obviously she was not going to be tamed right um essentially it was just fruitless it was pointless you know but the thing is like even if it was so terrible and toxic and they were both obviously unhappy it never felt like their relationship was truly over so even if you are rooting for Jaehoon and Hanju it doesn't feel right if he goes after her or if she goes after him like there's still someone there and so like if they start something she will be pretty much a rebound <laughs> and he will have baggage that he can't let go of and won't let go of him but Thankfully, the show never takes that route. Like, never goes there, you know? Jaehoon doesn't do anything until it's 100% over between him and Haewoon. Um, But actually, spoiler alert, he never does anything. They don't end up together. Nothing comes out of it. And so it feels disappointing if you rooted for them romantically. But, I mean, you know me. I like platonic relationships. <laughs> And it felt like, you know, why can't they just be, like, a good senior and junior to each other? You know, why can't they just um, support each other or be good friends to each other and understand what the other person is going through without it leading to something romantic? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I like their platonic relationship. And, you know, professional, <laughs> yeah. 
professionalism and all that. <laughs> you know, you know. Okay, next relationship. So Min and Minjun, her manager. Okay. Surprisingly, this is my favorite love line. Yeah. Surprisingly, this is what I ended up rooting for the most. Um, so So Min is the actress and Min, Hun, Min Jun is her manager and they were high school classmates and she told him to be her manager. And then that became his dream to be someone's manager. <laughs> it seems so stupid, right? But you know, she's a diva sometimes, and she's kind of an airhead, she's kind of needy, but he's the only one who can, like, keep up with her and, and truly understands her because she trusts him. And, and they're very, like, wordless about how they know each other and how they support each other. And you think, like, you know, when when he leaves the company, he stops being her manager, that's when she realizes that she likes him for more than what he does for her. Like a, f- a part of me was also thinking like does he does she really like him or does she like how he treats uh, how he treats her but as her manager though. Is she unable to separate that? But then like it was Unjung who who said this. Uh something about like you don't know if you have enough time so don't waste it doubting what you feel. Just just go for who you love because you never know how much time you have left with him which coming from Unjung means so much and so she does and like she realizes that she does genuinely like him it, it feels like that like she genuinely likes him for for who he is not just how he's treated her and the same goes for him like I, I think there's genuine like devotion in in how long he's been with her as her manager like it's pretty easy to quit a job, you know, especially if the girl's demanding, but he's stuck by her. And that must mean something. Yeah, so pretty cute relationship. Sad that it didn't get much screen time after they ended up together, but it's okay. Like, why drag it out? They're, they're, they're together and he's working for another uh, actress and she gets like, you know, mocked jealous and whatever but he she knows that he likes her he loves her so why should she take it out on him or be insecure about that okay um another thing i like about the show uh is that is the tone i I mentioned this earlier the tone or the genre um i can clearly see that this is a slice of life comedy show i was never confused about what it was trying to be and I love how this show alternates light moments with some heavier stuff and like the realizations of the characters. But it lets it like s- simmer, stew. <laughs> um, it lets it sink in, you know? Like sometimes you think, oh man, they're going pretty heavy here. They're gonna let up, you know? They're just gonna make a joke out of it because it's a comedy and they can't, you know, make it too deep or too dark. But it doesn't. It lets those moments be sad significant moments and then they they you know they let you feel it with with the music and the great acting and everything like it it just allows you to feel those emotions you know instead of just dropping pulling back and you know saying okay wait people aren't going to like it if it's too dark if it's too sad so let's make it comedic again like no no let them feel what they need to feel let them be sad. Let them think about their lives. Let them think about what they've been doing. About how how they're unhappy or how they want to be somewhere else or do something else. Let it be that way. You know, if it's funny, it's funny. If it's sad, it's sad. If it's heartwarming, it's heartwarming. Like, let's not, you know, let's not, let's not be half-hearted about what we're trying to do. If we're trying to be funny, let's go all in. Let's just make it super funny. If we're trying to be sad, let's go super sad. I've cried over this show, guys. It's it's gotten me twice. So both are Unjung related, of course. Um yeah. I I love that about this show. It does not it's not half-hearted about what it does. It goes all in. I love that. Okay, great thing about the show. The actors, they're all perfect. 
for me. I really can't say anything about anyone's performance. Especially the main three. Like, all of them are likable. You know, I feel like likable is difficult because it's like, is it the character or is it the acting? I can say it's somehow it's the acting more than it's the character. <laughs> because, you know, Jinju, I really wouldn't like her as a character. But chun he's... You know, she's like quirky. <laughs> she delivers that really well. You know, that that kind of... How do I describe it? But she, she does it well. Okay, basically, I don't hate Jinju. And that says a lot because I could easily hate her knowing me. <laughs> so all of them are likable. They, they deliver the cutesy and the funny stuff, but also like the heartwarming parts and then the sad parts like of course the standout for me is John Yobin because okay I just have to describe but like how she's in Vincenzo like when I first saw her in Vincenzo right and immediately when I saw her I thought this is like cheap knockoff Honey Lee from the fiery priest you know just like over the top dramatic trying to be funny and I just thought it was overacting Really, that's really how I thought. Or like, she she saw the writer and saw the fiery priest and said, oh my god, I have to be Honey Lee. I cannot be Honey Lee. Um, but I will try my best. And so it's just like, excessive. And then when I saw her here, her aura was completely different. Like, it was, it felt like it was not even the same person acting. Okay, and so to me, that's a good actress. Like, it is the aura. You know, it's not just the role. Like, of course, the role is completely different and the styling and and all that. Like, yeah, yeah, completely different. But even the aura has to be different because there are some... <laughs> Am I gonna talk crap about someone today? Perhaps I shall because I just watched her earlier today. Um, So some actresses have very drastically different characters, different styling, different everything, but the way they act those characters out is so similar that it makes no sense. For example, <laughs> Moon Gayong. <laughs> in her character uh, in Find Me in Your Memory and in True Beauty. Uh, True Beauty, I did not I started it, but I just, I knew it wasn't going to be for me. So I thought, why waste my time and energy, you know, hating something or talking crap about something when I know that it's just not meant for me? You know, I'm not going to put myself through that. So I just did it. And now I'm starting Find Me in Your Memory. I think we're in episode four. Um, The characters are so different. True Beauty is a, you know, whiny, high school, insecure girl whiny insecure high school girl you know going through some stuff like it makes sense that she talks you know very cutesy and like a whiny baby and all that like it's okay you know i'm not even gonna blame her like it's fine it's, it fits with the character cool but with find me in your memory it's like she's some sort of glamorous actress right but she's dolled up she's dressed as if she's in her late 20s but she acts and speaks Sometimes like how she would in True Beauty. So I'm like, how old is this character supposed to be if she's talking like that? I'm not that far into the plot. So maybe there's an explanation in the plot for that. And I have some theories, but like that would involve Find Me In Your Memory spoilers. And I'm not really into that. <laughs> I'm not going to give that. So my point is like totally different characters, totally different like setting and appearance and all that but it seems like even the acting is the same and once again i'm not that deep into the story yet to know if it's intentional or if it's supposed to be that way going back to be melodramatic i'm so sorry <laughs> jonyo being my best girl the aura is completely different i really want to watch her movies now she's more of a movies girl i really want to watch her because i want I want to see if her range is that good. I She's like a solid 7 or 7. I'll put her at a 7 in my acting rating scale. <laughs> so that means she's solidly good. Okay, and we'll see if she gets bumped up to an 8 or even a 9 because I love her so much so far. So yeah, acting, they're all great. They, they all really, really deliver it super well. And yeah, yeah, 
no no problems there next thing i loved about the show the ost this is the perfect ost this is my favorite ost one of my favorite osts of all time like the songs are lighthearted at times whimsical even in others and yet other songs are just super sad and beautiful and just perfectly used in the show you know i i really they're all just beautiful songs and they're fun and the stupid shampoo song <laughs> is my alarm in the morning i i <laughs> i wake up to that song guys i mean i wake up and then i turn off my alarm and then i go back to sleep but i do wake up to that song and i love it so much um it's one of the few osts where every single song that has singing all of the songs are in my like grand k-drama ost playlist okay that's like probably like 20 hours long at this point but yeah just perfect ost my favorite one of my favorites of all time and okay last like great thing about the show is the fact that the writer and the director are the same person the show is weird and I think that's why it has low ratings because it's it's pretty unconventional in many scenes and in many ways. But it's very intentional about it. Like, I think it, yeah, I mentioned this earlier, but it benefits from Lee Byung-hun. Is that actually his name? Lee Byung-hun. <laughs> yeah, Lee Byung-hun having complete control, you know, from writing to directing. It's kind of like Bong Joon-ho with Parasite. Whoa, that's a far comparison. But hey, he he wrote, he wrote it, he directed it, he even made like storyboards frame per frame. He knew exactly what he wanted in that film. And so everything he wrote is translates translated to the film or the show in this case, the way it was meant to be, you know? And so everything is intentional. And like as an actor. All you have to do is your best. <laughs> Just do your best to deliver what the director wanted in this scene, and you're good. No thinking involved all that much. And like it helps that all the actors he casted were pretty good and were like well suited for their roles. Yeah. Like I can clearly see the intention behind everything. So even if I don't necessarily like, you know, the wordy conversations and the comedic subplots and whatever like i don't mind because i kind of i know what vibe he's going for and like okay going back to the comedic subplots i realized like the show is be melodramatic and in a way jinju is writing stories about the people in her life right and so like it kind of makes sense that their stories are melodramatic like in a dramatic romance kind of way you you get my point like they are the mellow Oh, yeah, she's writing a melodrama. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the subplots, they make sense. Yeah, I understood. <laughs> epiphany moment. <laughs> I just had an epiphany in the middle of this recording. So, so yeah, everything is forgiven in this show. Because I know what they're going for. See? I think people should be writers and directors <laughs> at the same time more often. Just to make, like, a complete work. Because it just... It, it really is just great. You know, I understand everything that he's going for. And therefore, I'll accept it. Because it doesn't feel like there's a disconnect between the writing and the directing. Because I don't feel that disconnect, obviously, because it's the same person. I feel like I I understand and I accept everything I'm watching more. Right? Okay. Okay, this has gone on for much longer than I thought it would um so to end uh i'm surprised that i liked it this much i haven't heard a lot of people talk about this obviously um i'm super sad that it got low ratings like yeah only around one percent but it makes sense you know it's not a conventional k-drama and it really helps to know this director's movies and, and to know if you like his sense of humor or not it might even feel slow for others since like all they do in the show is work on the drama or the documentary and then by the end of the show they barely even begin it just skips over that part and goes straight to yeah it was successful and then they have to move on and do other things and be a part um but it's the journey 
not the destination. <laughs> um, has great characters that are well acted, good relationships, directing, writing, directing is very intentional. I can forgive everything. Best OST. I have not gotten enough of Slow Steps and the Shampoo Song. Um. And Moonlight, uh, some of my favorite songs, but but yeah, I really like Be Melodramatic. Like, okay, in my top ranking list for 2021, I think my top one is Stranger 2, my second is Live, third is Arthdal Chronicles, fourth is 18 again, and my fifth is Be Melodramatic. Yeah, so far, that's that's those are my top five for this year. I'll discuss that more. On uh, in next week's episode, uh, stay tuned for that. So thank you, thank you for listening, thank you for making it to the end of this podcast. Um, if you haven't watched it, you should. Be melodramatic is really good. If you're a slice of life fan like me, um, and you're not so much a fan of romance because it's not actually as romance heavy as I say it is. It's just that. When there is romance, I am annoyed. <laughs> it's just a me thing. You know me, you know me. So I'll shut up. Thank you for listening and <laughs> I will see you soon. Bye.